there's a lot of games out there that people tend to unanimously praise as amazing. Games that no matter who you ask, a large majority of people who have played it will say they've loved it or just enjoyed the experience. Every genre has these types of games with staples like Hades, God of War, Portal, Elden Ring. Really, there's so many critically acclaimed games that almost everyone loves. Now, of course, not everyone loves these games, but it's hard to disagree about how well made some of these games are, whether it be story, gameplay, graphics, or everything mixed into one. How often do you see true masterpieces in video games? I'd say it's more often than you'd expect. There's always been one game out there, though, that I've heard nothing but praise for, nothing but greatness for in every category across the board, and that game is Inscription. Inscription is, well, a weird game to put it lightly. In this video, I'm going to go over all three acts of Inscription, development of the game, and really just give my opinion on why I think it's just such a weird game as a whole, and in general, a masterpiece with storytelling. So this is a fair warning ahead of time. There's going to be some spoilers in this video if you've never played the game before. I'm going to have the video cut up in the chapters to go through each section of whatever I'm talking about. So if you want to skip ahead, feel free. Before we jump into what the game is, let's talk about the development of the game as a whole. Inscription was created by Daniel Mullins during the 2018 Ludum Dare 43 Game Jam Festival, where participants had to make a game in two to three days with the theme being Sacrifices Must Be Made. After the game fest was done, Daniel put the game on itch.io, which allowed it to gain a following. And since his latest game, The Hex, was fully released, it allowed him to focus more on fleshing out Inscription and figuring out the base game. Of course, eventually he found out what he wanted in the four scribes or main bosses you meet throughout the game all have their own theme with Leshy and PO3 being the main focus compared to Grimora and Magnificus. We're going to talk more about them later of course but we're just getting those names out of the way now. We're, they're, they're important trust me. Regardless of that Inscription eventually released on October 19th of 2021 and then received a free update in December of 2021 that had a beta version of Casey's Mod which is the difficulty enhancer in the game which allows the player to gain more starting cards and really change the difficulty of the game up and Casey's mod was fully released on March 17th of 2022. That's all the development information I found. It really wasn't too much, pretty basic as a whole, but where the game truly shines is inside. So let's talk about the core gameplay first of this beautiful game. Let's talk about the main gameplay that we see in Inscription, and that's deck building and some small roguelike aspects. Throughout all three acts, you're collecting cards and building the best deck possible. Personally, for me, the first act was my favorite in terms of card collecting and how easy it was to understand, but I will say that I absolutely absolutely love how the art style and game changes up as the acts go on. It makes every single act feel like a whole new game, but even with that feeling, the core gameplay does not really change up too much. In Act 1, you must sacrifice cards to gain blood and bones, which will allow you to play other cards depending on the cost of them. Some cards will cost 2 bones, some will cost 4 blood, and some will be free to play. With a sacrifice system like this, it already makes Inscription one of the most unique games I've ever seen, and it clearly worked. I'm surprised we don't see more Inscription-inspired games out there compared to like Vampire Survivor. There's a million auto shooters out there, but to be fair, it's probably a lot harder to make a game like Inscription compared to Vampire Survivors. No disrespect to Vampire Survivors, I'm not a game dev, but I imagine it's a little bit easier to make something like an auto shooter compared to a fleshed out story deck building game, you know? Anyways, along with the cost of all these cards, each card also has a sigil, and sigils will just power the cards up. And there is way too many sigils to cover all of them, but I do love how the game makes it very easy to remember what all of them do, as you just need to right click on it, and it'll tell you exactly what it does. The game is genius with all these sigils, and makes you really think about the type of run you want, and adds a lot of strategy to the game. I'll say my favorite sigil was a combination of the Mantis God sigil, where you attack multiple spaces in one turn, and the Blood Sack sacrifice sigil where the card is worth three blood in a sacrifice compared to one. Now to top off act one with deck building, there's a small roguelite aspect in the game. I mean, it's kind of like a small roguelite aspect. I don't see this game as a roguelite that much, but does it really matter? I don't think it does. And that aspect is the death card. Now you get something like this in act three with making your own card, but the potential for an absolutely overpowered card in act one is nuts. If you fail a run, you get to make your own death card and choose health, power, cost to play, and sigils from other cards in your failed run. After after I played Act 1 for about 7 hours, I was able to create one of the most insane cards I've ever seen. Like 14 plus damage in a turn? How is that even fair? And that's the deck build in Act 1 alone. I didn't talk about the story or anything like that. I'll get to that soon. I'm going to try to cover everything that I can in this goddamn weird game. Now Act 2 starts off and reminds me a lot of Earthbound with how the game looks visually and kind of plays. The deck build and aspect of the game is still there and to start it off, you get to choose which type of card you want to start the act off with. Your main goal in Act 2 is 
to defeat all the four scribes who turn out to be your talking cards from the previous act. So it's sad that I lose my best friend the stink bug, but the good news is that this act still introduces so much to the game and heavily expands on it, which is insane. Like I said, the goal is to defeat each of the scribes, but each one has a unique type of deck that's related to them. And at the start of the act, you get to pick which type of cards you want to start with. We have the two from act one with blood and bone deck where the cards need to be sacrificed for blood and then of course need and bones to play the other. We have energy cards where cards will cost energy to play and you gain more energy every turn and it recharges every turn. And then we have the mox crystals. There's three colors of mox and each of them has a gem associated with them. And you need to match up those crystal colors with your cards in order to play them. Throughout act two, I didn't really use the mox crystals too much. I didn't really understand it that well for my pea brain. I kind of mostly used the bones as that was my start in deck. As the act went on, I started using more energy and blood though, which is good. Variety is always good. And then outside of new cards and the deck options, there isn't much deck building to discuss for Act 2. You can trade your foils you receive at the end of battle if you did extra damage with a trader to receive more cards. And throughout the act, you can find packs to open that contain cards. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. And then finally, we have Act 3, which is pretty similar to Act 1 in terms of gameplay. But the deck building aspect is much different. The gameplay itself has you battling your cards on a grid with five spaces instead of four. And most of the act is focused on energy cards with a few mox cards here and there. Act 3 of course introduces new cards to try, and like the previous acts can trade pelts for cards from a trader, buy some cards with currency, and even get to make your own cards occasionally. That's all the deck building really I came across in my playthrough. I'm sure I missed some, but really all of it is so unique. And the way the game opens up in Act 2 and 3 and really changes how the cards work, honestly it hooked me right into it. Despite Act 1 being my favorite in terms of gameplay and story, Act 2 and 3 got me super invested into this story, like oh my god. I'll be honest, during Act 1, I was getting a little bit bored going through freaking Leshy every single fight. But, oh my god, Act 2 and 3 were amazing! And what really gets you super hooked onto this game, what got me super hooked onto this game, is the story and the NPCs. Oh my god. The way that inscription is written, I, I can't even put it in the words how special this feels. So fair warning ahead, there may be some spoilers up ahead, just to let you know. Let's go back to Act 1 now with story. You start off feeling like Leshy is the bad guy, the major villain, and you gather these talking cards with the Stoat, Stinkbug, and Stunted Wolf as they keep talking about escaping the game. And we can all agree in the comments below, the Stinkbug is the MVP, 100%. Besides the path choosing in Act 1, to get into Act 2, you get to do all these intricate puzzles, gathering items, and eventually get yourself a roll of film to put into Leshy's camera and take their phone. Photo. as if you fail a run they take a photo of you but once you do get into act two you then learn of all the four scribes who turn out to be all of the talking cards along with leshy which blew my mind it took a twist that i was not really expecting and then in act two of course like i said before you must battle and defeat each of the scribes and then choose one to take the place of as we know that all the scribes have their own deck of cards that are related to either magic blood sacrifice energy and bones all that stuff each area where the scribes are in has you solve little puzzles and battle a few enemies to gain access to boss and if you lose a battle you can just try again. One thing that's kind of hidden, and I personally missed it when playing through, is grabbing a key in this act to gain access to a secret boss in the third act. To gain the key, you must grab certain cards to combine together, and then grab the key in an area on the overworld map. Which I'll say, I love that overworld map. It reminds me a lot of Super Mario World. And that's act two if the story's in the NPCs. I didn't do much for act one, I'm sorry, but act two was probably my least favorite one, as it was the shortest one for me to complete but they're all still really good, I promise. But Act 3 begins with PO3, aka the Stoat, taking control of the game. This part of the story has some Dark Souls inspiration, but the core gameplay of deck building and battling is very similar to Phase 1. You're on PO3's version of the world of Inscription, and it's called Botopia. Your goal is to battle four Uber bots, which are all representations of the scribes that are located in different parts of Botopia. I will say here that I love the creativity of all the Uber bots, especially the unfinished boss, as you get to control the gimmicks of the fight and even make your own cards that get sent to another player fighting the boss at the same time as you and for me when i fought them nobody else was fighting them at the same time so i got stuck using my own card but Back to Botopia. The traveling is easy as you just click an arrow on where you want to go, and the fights aren't too hard. If you do end up losing a fight, you have to go back to your last save point and you drop all your money, but it's very easy to regain your money back. And if you make it to a new save point, all the fights you did are now permanently gone, so you don't have to worry about redoing some battles. In terms of length, I'll say it's shorter than Act 1, as there's a lot more puzzles and gimmicks inside of a run for the first act, but it's still definitely longer than Act 2. Just like in Act 1, you get to stand up and solve some puzzles that help 
you unlock items or just progress the story. Either way, at this point in the game, I felt PO3 was just evil and didn't really know how to feel about the other scribes as this whole universe just seemed to be a little messed up. But once you get all the uberbots destroyed, you go back to the beginning and listen to PO3 talk about the Great Transcendent and how you helped him finish the game inscription. He thanked you, the challenger Luke, who we will discuss in a second, for taking photographs, giving him access to your hard drive, and connecting him to the internet to upload it. At this point, I was putting so many pieces together. And then of course, you know what happens next, I presume. As PO3 is uploading the game, Leshy rips its head off. It's not really much of a shocker because during Act 3, you meet up with all the other scribes while doing puzzles that PO3 wanted you to do, and they tell you they plan on killing PO3 because he's kind of, you know, taken over. And then after you see PO3 without a head, it's really time for the end game. You play a game with all the scribes while the game inscription itself is deleted, and watch everything go away. Watching it all go away is a little bittersweet, as this is one of the most crazy stories I've ever seen in the game, and I know the conclusion is, you know, right there. But even with the game concluding, there's still one more thing to talk about about the story. And honestly, it was one of my most favorite parts of the story, and that's you, the challenger. I didn't really mention this yet, but between each act, you're learning the life of Luke Carter, who's a trading cards content creator in the game, and the challenger inside of Inscription is their POV of playing the game. As you learn, they discover an old trading card pack of a game called Inscription at a garage sale and find a card with coordinates on it, which then leads them to find a floppy disk with the game Inscription on it. Really, I don't want to delve too deep into it, as I feel this story between acts is much more important to avoid spoilers on. And just in case some silly Billy is now intrigued to play Inscription for the first time and they're here i will not spoil this part completely but as someone who has played the game up until the credits roll i will say that i absolutely loved this side of the story seeing the videos and the path that the story takes was like watching a psychological horror movie and i just loved it it helped keep me invested in the game so much more and that's the stories and npcs really it's a little jumbled and messed up and everything but i feel i did my best to talk about in this video but before we talk about my own opinion finally I want to talk about one more thing in the game, and that's the puzzles. Inscription can be defined as so many things. Horror, deck building, narrative, God, the roguelite. There's so many, so many terms that you can use to describe this game, all wrapped into one. But the puzzles are something very unique about it that I love. Each act has their own sets of puzzles, and all the hints that the game leaves around for you to solve them, they're great. And the puzzles themselves are pretty simple and really enjoyable. I'm not the biggest fan of puzzle games as a whole, but the story progression with the puzzle solving, just, it's so well executed. The puzzles in the first and third act related to sigils on the drawers are so well done and require some game knowledge to get them done, and the rewards are so beneficial to them. Clock puzzles in the safe, which are simple but elegant. Yak 3 puzzles, where it's just math or rotating sigils, they're all genuinely fun and not really rage inducing. Hell, I didn't even get one of the puzzles in Act 3 on the drawers. I couldn't figure it out. I don't I, I don't know what else to say about the puzzles, really. I don't want to spoil them because, you know, they're puzzles. They're more fun when you figure it out. But I just wanted to talk about them quickly just because they're so well done. They, they had to be included in this video. Let's be honest. And that's Inscription, really. It's one of the weirdest games I've ever played. But the story is so well made with the real like aspects of Luke, the fourth wall break and the puzzles characters, deck building, all of it is so impressive, really. You can easily see why this game has won a good handful of awards when it first came out, and I can understand why it has an overwhelmingly positive score on Steam with a 97% positive review score, with over 75,000 reviews. You don't see that very often. The game truly is one of the best story games I've played, and I don't consider it too much of a roguelite, but all the elements it has makes it phenomenal. I didn't even get to touch on Casey's mod too much, which is the difficulty enhancers to unlock after the credits roll, because I I haven't played them yet, but it's good to see a game like this does give you options of replayability to go back and challenge yourself with the Act 1 loadout of deck building. It's something I do want to play in the future, and maybe I missed something while covering it, and if I did, I'm sorry. This game has a lot of secrets and a lot that I missed, but I covered everything I saw and everything I knew about this game. And at first, I hated this game. Streaming it the first time was not fun. I wasn't having a good time and didn't plan on finishing it, but the review score and hearing nothing but positive things about the game and how you need to let it open up more and progress the story hearing and seeing all that made me determined to finish the game and i'm glad i did it i'll say it's probably not like a top 10 game of all time for me but i will say it left a very good impression on me and i'm super glad that i picked it up why replay it in the future eh, 
Maybe. And really, for about $20 on Steam, it's a hell of a steal. Even if you're only playing through it once, being able to experience a story like this is worth much more than $20. And it's really something you need to experience firsthand to fully understand why people speak so highly of it. I get it now. I understand the praise for this game and all the love that it gets. It, it's really well deserved and it has nothing but respect from me. If you don't have a PC, well, lucky for you, this game has released on the Nintendo Switch on December 1st of 2022. So if you're a Switch gamer, this is one you 100% should pick up. That's all really. I appreciate you watching this video on Inscription as I didn't really know how to tackle this game, but I knew I wanted to make a video on it. I restarted the script like five or six different times. It was absolutely ridiculous, but let me know how, I, let me know how it was. Like it? Dislike it? Tell me, leave, leave a comment what you think and appreciate you watching. And a huge shout out to the people that support me on Patreon. Still, I have slowed down a bit on videos, but you know, these making these type of videos takes time and I do love it, but it just takes time and life is busy. You understand. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.